From the outset, this presentation is dedicated to a phenomenological analysis of gesture in percussion performance. Here, I refer to the performative gestures of both composing and performing. And to dispel an impending terminological confusion, I consider composing and performing gestures to be performative, in spite of differences in the tools employed. Mallets, implements and bare hands are in most cases a percussionist means of producing sound. Pen, pencil, paper and more recent laptops are the composer's tools. What emerges is, is a shared experiential process within the human body, specifically of the hands, which are man's outer brain according to Cartesian and Kantian tradition. Hands that form the first bond in the relationships between composer and performer, between score and sound, between music and the listeners. What will follow will be a gestural analysis from the standpoint of gestures as phenomenon, not a score analysis of musical material. For the latter, the reader can refer to well-known written essays about the composers and composition considered here. Moreover, this gestural analysis will proceed by examining the score without excluding digressions and aphorisms that emerge from such textual observation. I open the score of Stockhausen's Cyclus, dated 1959, for one percussionist. After absorbing the complexity of the performance notes, I attempt to decipher the first page of the actual written music. Here I am referring to the first page of the Universal Edition text. According to the composer's instruction, the piece can begin from any of the score's 16 pages, running through all the pages in the given order, from which comes the score title, Zyklus, cycle in English, up to the first entry, percussive stroke, on the page that the performer started with. A number of preliminary observations arise here. Do I hear the sounds of the music by looking at the score? Do I envision the physical gestures needed to perform the piece? Do I instinctively favor some parts of the written music over others? Do I spontaneously recollect and compare other compositions with similar gestures, notations, instrumentation? The order of the question here is arbitrary. Further questions on perception may emerge later. I take note as well that so far I am considering a relation with the score from a performance perspective. However, those observations will return later when I consider a compositional angle. I will give voice to these questions when I embark on an investigation and comparison of a few selected works for percussion. What I'm trying to bring into focus first is the liminal convergence of musical and kinetic gesture. How and when sounds is transformed into gesture, compositionally and performatively. And how and when gesture is transformed once again into sound, performatively and auditorily, within the physical medium that allows one to hear it. By using the term liminal convergence, I'm stipulating a lacuna between the sound unheard within the sound that germinates within the body, and the sound heard without by the composer, performer, and listener in the acts of listening throughout years. A gap ostensibly circumvented by a leap of faith that connects whoever writes the music and whoever performs it. However, this leap of faith is not metaphysical or mystical, nor it is hermetic. Per contra, it has a perceptual milieu in consciousness, a locus, an intermezzo, a liminal convergence within the strata of time and space in which the body flows. This concealed space, an interstice, and in between, is the place the Japanese philosopher Kitaro Nishida calls intuitive knowledge. That term acquired a doubtful position in post Cartesian philosophical traditions and Western historical development within modern scientific thought because of an ambiguous raison d'etre. In Western thought, the dualistic mind-body, negative-positive, pathos, logos, dichotomies embedded within scientific objectification do not consider nor allow either for elements of ambiguity or in-betweenness. Nishida's intuitive knowledge calls into question the existence of a third space of consciousness, opening a crevasse in the tradition of conscious-unconscious psychological dualism. 
In his Intuition and Reflection and Self-Consciousness, Kitaro Nishida argues that experience and rumination regarding experience are not chronologically differentiated. Hence, the time of the sensor's experience is synchronous and equal to the time of thinking about and evaluating the experience, while the former is still evolving. This is what he calls the intuition of the experience. Intuition, Nishida argues, is a form of knowledge. This concept of Nishida resonates with the notion of Ma, a word that stands for pause, gap or emptiness in the Japanese philosophical tradition. Contemporary architect Isozaki Arata argues that Ma stands at the edge of a particular mode of experience that empties the objective subjected words, collapsing any dichotomies and differentiation of space-time relation. In Japan, space and time are conceived as omnipresent and analogous. Rather than being separate from each other, space and time relate. Thus, space is perceived as identical with the events or phenomena occurring in it, that is, space is recognized only in its relation to time flow. We will return to this preliminary reflection as the present investigation continues to meander. I am looking at the Zeklus score once again. The instructions state that in some instances I am requested to select what to play from the written music material. I notice in fact that not all the music notated on the page can be played simultaneously by an individual performer. By observing this page I also realize that the spatial configuration, the layout of the notated music, the work is a composite score of graphical and traditional western notation, alludes to a gestural outcome, a kinesphere of the human body involved in the performance. By selecting the material to play, I am selecting body movements that go with it. I might not be entirely aware of this, but the moment I evaluate the combination of instruments to be played, I am already thinking in both musical and kinetic terms. I pause, leaving the score aside momentarily to clarify and elaborate on that last sentence. The performing act of the percussionist dealing with a multi-percussion set is a remarkable one. Most instrumentalists are used to the geometry, design and shape of their instrument. Practicing over years, they gain an intimate confidence and reliance on the peculiarities and distinctive reactions of their instruments in response to their touch and the manipulation of the instruments itself. Shaping dynamics, articulation and timbre with limbs such as fingers and feet or with tactile organs and oral cavities such as lips and mouth. By contrast, the multi-percussion set is most often an heterogeneous paraphernalia of musical instruments, object trouvés, and custom-made objects. It requires continuous re-evaluation and adjustment of the kinetic and proprioceptive ability of the performer. Geometries, trajectories in space, and bodily gestures are constantly transformed. In this respect, it could be said that every multi-percussion set is it in fact an instrument of its own. I return to the score. The writing combines a number of concurrent systems called structures in the composer's performing notes. They are selectable by the performer so that the final combination of sound heard is variable. Every system in this respect is an island, an archipelago of time. Every page is a tectonic of space. This brings up memory of John Cage 27 minutes 10.554 seconds, the first ever solo percussion piece dated 1956, only a few years before Stockhausen's Cyclos. Cage very similarly asks the performer to make decisions about musical material to be selected and played. I move away from these memories of Cage and return to the Cyclos score. Variable sounds elements and fixed sounds elements, as per performing instructions, are therefore combined. The placement of the instruments is fixed, as provided by the composer. A framework concurrently suggesting freedom and limitation of choices. The tempo marking is not specified, but duration and intervals of entry are drawn to scale. Equal distances correspond to equal amounts of time, as instructions remark. 
The performer, by choosing a certain tempo and some combination of structures and variable sounds element, as having greater playability, allowing a more controlled and deliberate gesture in space than others. The resulting sound textures and density will be vary according to the chosen tempo. Here, in relation to specific body structure, certain decisions will be more suitable than others. There is a variable and at times considerable amount of space to be covered in order to strike the surfaces of the different instruments involved. Synchronized gestures covering space outside the kinesphere of the average human body ask for coordinate effort of limbs and muscles, and enhance proprioceptive capability of the body. A general feeling of emplacement, I borrow here the notion of emplacement from anthropologist David Howes. Hence, the musical score is a map of possibilities, a macrocosmos of potentialities. Here, I am envisioning the score as a map a representation of countless perspectives, a viewpoint like torchlight that is cast on a path at night, tracing sonic contours of a portion of reality, the camera obscura and its mirroring in the eyes of the beholder, the viewer, the subject who is never within the field of the viewer's own vision, the listeners who are never in the field of their own audibility. I'm thinking of soundography, mapping sonic profiles within a given amount of time and space, Unlike the traditional notion of mapping, of charting space with the sense of sight and the aid of geometrical perspective, the birth of Western cartography as a system of representation and definition of spatial embodied reality, when mapping sounds, the sense of hearing enters into conflict with definition of the space in which the charting takes place. A topographic map traces lines, borders, boundaries, implicitly excluding or including something, without and within. Sound travels regardless of these lines and borders. The space within and without collide with the outpouring sound waves. Cyclus score consists of 16 A3 side pages. On every page of music notation, sui generis signs, lines and shapes are laid out in consideration of the limited space of the paper sides. As in a geodetic map, space is represented in scale to the area available on which to draw these lines. But lines do not represent sound. The letter is not on the page. Furthermore, it cannot even be contained within the borders of a page or of any physical space whatsoever. Here, the space of the graphical representation of the score does not correspond to the space of sound. This representation is reductive. We encounter a paradoxical dichotomy. The writing of the score is in close proximity to the kinectics of the performer's gestures, but distant from the sound resulting from these gestures. The representation of three-dimensional body gesture is laid down flat on a piece of paper, with the drawing gesture that reduces it to the bidimensional surface. The resulting sound can never be on the paper, is never represented, is never contained in any limited space, except perhaps an echoic chambers and sealed recording room. The score is a map of gestures in premise, and only incidentally of sounds. The score collects and mirrors the equivalence of the gesture of the composer's pens and the performer's hand. More than anything else, a kinetic map. Turning to Morton Feldman's The King of Denmark, written in 1964 for one percussionist. Instrumentation here is only partially given, together with suggestions on broad colors and categories of sound, skin, metal, bell-like sounds, etc. Through graphic notation in boxes determining high, middle and low registers of pitches, the latter never fully specified, and numbers indicating the amount of sounds to be played in each box. Very similar to Zyklus, every box is a unit of tempo, suggested in the composer's notes at the metronome marking of 66 to 92. All the instruments must be played without sticks or mallets, a striking difference from the previous 2000 work. The performer may use fingers and of any part of his arm, specify Feldman's instructions. The code of the piece is extraordinarily dissimilar from the rest of it. A stave is added below the boxes with notated pitches in treble clef asking simultaneously to strike a B3, C4, D4, E flat 4 on vibraphone keys 
and after a short while by producing a G sharp 5 on a glockenspiel. A fourth remarkable difference in comparison to Stockhausen's cyclos. The freedom of choice in instrumentation and positioning of the instruments, as none of this is specified by the composer. After a quick look at the ending of the piece, I'm back at the very beginning, observing the opening page. Seven sounds to be played on a high register within one box, a metronome 66 to 92, followed by two boxes of rest, one grace note in box number 4, an individual sustained note starting at box number 8 and ending at box number 11. The reading is linear, the direction of the readings is univocal from left to right, the musical gesture is contained within the boxes following the fine path of events. Here we are faced with a score alluding to content that is not there, salvo the coda, gestures without gestures. The boxes are indeed vacuous numbers without reference to instruments, to gestures, nor to sound. The space of the page is segmented into equal parts by three systems of boxes three pages of score with three systems per individual page. The continuous and linear development of the box system destitute of any specificity in the space of the page. Every page is equal to the previous one and to the next. Inside the boxes, numbers bloom and disappear. Gestures, musical and bodily alike, are opaque, diaphanous. The coda, with its sudden specificity of pitches and instrumentations, seems to herald the ending of an oneric state, the reverie of a rhetorical epigram, the composer's ironic innuendo, at the end of a musical game of numbers without written sounds, a metallic G-sharp. The score of King of Denmark is elliptical, yet its structure is linear and uniform. Elisions occur at the level of the content of gesture and musical material, because most of it is not on the written page. However, this score, because of its peculiarity, can be applied to a different game, following Wittgenstein's notion of language games, using the same set of rules. Numbers can be the amount of words to be spoken, the amount of steps to be taken, the amount of brush strokes for a canvas, of food to be eaten, of photos to be taken. Every new set will consequently generate a new set of body gestures to go with it, and a whole array of kinetic possibilities or impossibilities. While Zyklos is a map, the King of Denmark is more akin to a meta-map, a vessel of potentialities, a conceptual device. Without a specific instrumentation, and therefore without a setting, the gestures of the performer and the kinectics involved are never addressed directly in the score. There is an unseen aura of motility. The game of numbers obliterates the body that reduces the sound to text per unit of time. An irony. Tactility in Feldman's work is enhanced because of the request to use only fingers, hands, or part of the arm to produce sounds. A perceptive tactile body with skin in direct contact with percussive surfaces, while bodily gestures remain concealed as backdrop to the numerical score. Feldman provides an array of numbers to be processed. The performer has to supply a gestural map to fulfill the score and the musical outcome. In my end is my beginning. In the dramatic turn, I look back at the philosophical notion of mind. This circularity allows me to add the last example to this paper, a digression within digressions. The performance practice and notation of taiko drums in the context of Japanese no theater. It is recognized that the notion of mind is central to the consideration of tempo in traditional performance of Japanese music specifically and Japanese art more generally. Ma is the way the space and time between rhythmic phrases, the strikes of the drum, are shaped and conceived, both in praxis and the philosophical approach to taiko performance. A few distinctions to take note of. Taiko drums are usually played in an ensemble. The existence of many original styles and form of taiko drum practices. The variety of taiko drum size and shape employed in specific traditional contexts, from no to Kabuki, Gagaku, Bugaku, etc. Lastly, in relation to the previous two pieces, here I am looking into a percussion form rather than to a specific piece of music and or composer. My interest at this point lies in the close connection with the notion of Ma 
and also the specificity of performance gestures of taiko drums and its notation within the limits of traditional no theater. Keeping in mind the ostensible differences, historical, stylistic and conceptual, with the two aforesaid works by Caroline Stockhausen and Morton Feldman, I proceed in this analysis of taiko drum gestures, venturing to find convergences in the diverging paths. In deciphering the no Hayashi music notation, the first observation comes to mind. The use of columns with combination of symbols, phonetic letters and numbers to mark beats resemble closely a timetable in the fashion of the handsome timeline of the Eusebian Chronicles, 4th century Europe, and the early chronologies to come. The Hayashi notation is concerned with the strength of the strokes marked by circles of different sizes and additional symbols for special strokes. Their positioning on the beats, marked by the numbers, and by drum calls whose syllables and signs are marked in the score. The notation for the three fundamental drums is no theater, taiko, otsuzumi, and kotsuzumi, consists of three columns placed next to each other. The presence of drum calls spoken and sung by the performers is peculiar to taiko. Stockhausen's refrain, date 1959, adopts this practice, asking the performer to vocalize with tongue clicks on five approximate pitches and short phonetic syllables near the sounds they play on their instruments. Again, the German composer, Dien Stag Haus Licht, Tuesday from Light, is an opera written for and premiered by the Imperial Gagako Ensemble at the Tokyo National Theater in 1977. A convergence. Taiko combined drums and vocalization in a highly formalized performance where movements are strictly controlled and codified. The score includes notation for both the variety and consistency of drum strokes and the vocalization marking. The body and its gestures are defined before end by the tradition that accompanies no performances as well as taiko drums more generally. The emplacement of the body's gesture is part of the ritual before the ritual begins. The score marks the chronological passing of time the drum strokes require, the syllables to be spoken. The written musical score is accompanied by the unseen but nonetheless highly significant score. The concealed score of the oral tradition, the word of mouth, or ceremonial embodied praxis, preserved and passed down generation after generation, engraved by practice rather than pencil. I observe that in taiko drum score the body is absent, replaced by a tradition that supplements the gestures and conditioning of the body. In Stockhausen's Cyclos and Felsman's The Kingdom of Denmark, the body is the only presence in the score, not supplemented by tradition of any sort. In all of them, however, the sound is in absentia, before and beyond the noted score, a further convergence. In conclusion, the noted scores allude closely to a mapping of bodily gestures, a charting of kinetics, as well as an interwined topography of the space in the body and the space without, a Lefebvrean enveloping spaces, body and non-body. Rather than the musical contour, the signs of the score bring forward gestural cues, perceptive potentialities, temporal and spatial relationships, architectural blueprints, without an explicit sonic outcome. I withdraw here on the edge of a gestural mount. My excursions into the peculiarities of gesture in percussion music is in fact at an end, limited by the time at my disposal rather than the vastness of the topic and its eccentric ramifications.